Martin. I'm Alex Selenikoff, uh, Dean of the New School for Social Research. Uh, and this is our third in a series of talks on the, the crisis in the Mideast. It's also um, the, uh, the, new, the NSSR's general seminar, uh, which has been a tradition at NSSR since our founding in 1933, uh, where faculty have talked about uh, intellectual and political and current issues uh, of great importance and significance. It's been a way that the NSSR faculty has kind of come together around uh, significant issues. Uh, and there are few issues in the world more significant at the moment than the, the war happening in the Middle East. Uh, our speaker today is Professor Omri Boehm, who is Professor of Philosophy at uh, NSSR. Uh, and his topic is, uh, can we imagine a day after uh, some fears and hopes? And Omri, we're doing this webinar style, which means that you're unable to see the audience. Um, I know you'd like to be able to see everybody, but uh, as questions come in, I'll be sure to uh, say who who this, who this the who has asked the question and hope you can have a, a relationship in this virtual sort of sense. Omri is speaking to us um, from Berlin, where he has been uh, this semester. Um, Armi, thank you so much for joining us, and we're really looking forward to your remarks. Yeah, thanks very much. It's, um, as I was telling uh, Alex and Sherry, um, I'm sorry that I, um, well, at first I really wanted to actually to do this in person. Um, um, and then I was sorry that I realized that this was going to be a webinar um, uh, setting so that I cannot see the people who are actually participating. Um, I was looking forward to be able to talk to colleagues and students mostly um, about those topics. Um, looking forward is of course a problematic term because um, uh, the reasons for this are um, horrifying. It's very difficult to find the right words, but um, they keep um, slip um, out of my eyes and uh, I'm sure that uh, many others. The um, the title of the, um, this presentation was in some sense um, not the accurate, not the most accurate one, I think. And I want to say a word about that before I um, give a short presentation. Um, the title that was announced was uh, Imagining the Day After um, um, Some Hopes and Fears. And it was pointed out that perhaps imagining today as the bombs are falling, um, uh, imagining the day after is, um, um, I don't know if grotesque, but almost grotesque. Perhaps I could have said um, after October 7th, some hopes and fears or something along those lines. What I um, intend to do is to try to speak for about 30 minutes about what I take to be the mindset of uh, especially Israeli thinking, um, um, liberal Israeli thinking um, that I think is tied to the some of the holes um, that are unfolding during this war because of the deadlock in which we're finding ourselves. I think that one of the most um, significant facts that are sort of known, but are not being um, um, thematized enough, and I'd like to thematize it somewhat here, um, some of the facts that are most significant, um, one of the facts that is most significant is that Israel actually went into this new crisis to, into October 7 through the back door of another, through um, a constitutional crisis, our constitutional moment, which was itself unprecedented and historical and with monumental consequences and dangerous consequences to Israeli democracy on the one side, but also to the whole region. The, the reason for the juridical overhaul um, um, had everything to do with um, the attempt of the Israeli government to um, grab more land and to um, um, establish Israeli sovereignty in a post two-state era. I think that this is related to the way in which this war is being fought. But I am very concerned also um, about the thought that the alternative to this logic is posited by um, the old ways of thinking, the old models of thinking about, say, liberal Zionism and the two-state solution, um, or um, uh, thoughts along this line. So what I'd like to do is to offer a critique of um, um, the situation that we had during the constitutional, constitutional moment leading to this war also, um, and then a critique of some of the uh, suggestions made by 
uh, jur jurists, um, uh, philosophers, uh, legal experts um, on this wall. And then I can stop and we can either discuss uh, some of the more theoretical aspects of the thing that I'm saying, but we can also speak much more concretely about the political situation in Gaza, about um, possibilities still to imagining, if not the, uh, uh, the further day after, then the immediate day after, some of the horrifying possibilities that we're seeing unfolding now um, um, in the territory <coughs> and so forth and so forth. So really this is uh, mostly a, um, just an introduction that as far as I'm concerned is um, an introduction to whatever discussion people would like to have um, in whichever direction that Alex would allow. Um, um, and with this, I can um, read a, um, a short um, uh, paper. Very shortly after October 7th, David Grossman, I think he requires no introduction um, in this audience. David Grossman published a piece in Haaretz in Hebrew. It also made its way into English, German, and I'm sure many other languages. Its title, Pose the question, who will we be when we rise from the ashes? So I, I, the question is important for me, so I'll, I'll read it again. Who will we be when we rise from the ashes? In the piece itself, Grossman soon raised another question and related it to the first. And what do those who brandished the absurd notion of a binational state say today? Of course, Grossman meant this question as a rhetorical one, but since I take myself to be one proponent of that alleged absurd a binational state, and in the months before October 7th, um, I did quite extensively promote this idea in Hebrew, even in Aretz, I'd like to use this opportunity to start sketching my response. Here is what a one state supporter like myself has to say today. Here are my fears and my hopes. And among other things, here is what I have to say about the question that Grossman asked initially, who we will be for the two questions that he posed, I'm not sure that he realized, were deeply related to one another. The question of the one state or two state solution and the question, who will we be? So first, the question, who will we be when we rise from the ashes? still understands the question of Jewish-Israeli identity, who will we be, through the prism of Jews, specifically as sheer victims. Effectively, Grossman was asking on October 7th, who will we be when we recover from these pogroms ashes? Now that could seem like the right feeling on October 7th, not quite to me, I can understand it, but it was not the way I was thinking about it. But it could seem like the right way to think about October 7th, because in some sense, in some important sense, what happened on October 7th was a problem. The systematic killing of families one by one, the sadistic tying together of children to their parents while burning them alive, the systematic rape of women and men, and abuse, including sexual mutilation of bodies, celebrating these crimes publicly, rather than hiding the crime. All this belonged to a logic of systematic dehumanization that could not be separated from Hamas's anti-Semitic covenant of 1988, stating, for example, and this is a quote, the day of judgment will not come about until Muslims kill the Jews, and when the Jew will hide behind stones and trees, the stones and trees will say, oh Muslims, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him, end quote. I think this line is important to read because I wouldn't be surprised if this exact line, very, very well known in some circles, this anti-Semitic genocidal image was alive in the minds of those who conducted the massacre of October 7th. It's not too speculative to think that quite a few of the people who conducted this massacre, and those who watched them and glorified them, actually thought that that very day has arrived. An author like David Grossman, 
was speaking very much from that perspective, I think. Nevertheless, understanding October 7th as a pogrom is also misleading. To speak of that massacre as a pogrom is to place it along a long list of, um, or a long history of persecution of Jews, where Jews were in the minority without a state, and the state itself welcomed the massacres, either by neglecting to prevent it, and more likely and more commonly by encouraging and participating in it. On October 7th, the Jews who were massacred were citizens of their own powerful state, and those who conducted the massacre were themselves stateless and under Israeli occupation, control, and persecution. Those who asked to reduce October 7th to the setting of a pogrom took a step, therefore, in a direction that viewed Israelis as helpless victims, and therefore in the direction of releasing Israel from its moral and legal responsibilities, especially in relation to the Palestinians. In fact, talk of pogrom suggested that what was unfolding was a war of survival for the Jews, which by definition, pushes against the limits of law and of morality. But as a sovereign state with clear occupation ambitions, as a regional superpower, Israel must be strictly respons held responsible for what it does, for what it did, and for what it will do. Pogrom victims did not have such responsibilities. Back to Grossman, the question, who, we, who will we be? should have been already on October 7th, not just about when we rise from the ashes, as if we were pogrom victims, but already then it was clear, and it was clear for Israelis with open eyes, and not just to them, who will we be after we end the war in Gaza that will now follow? Will we become a state conducting crimes against humanity, which would imply that it will be hard to go and teach our children to be Israelis, looking themselves as such in the mirror. The question, who will we be, had to be formulated on that day. That was the first thing that the promoters of absurd notions, like a binational state, said on October 7th. And I really propose to make here no mistakes on October 7th, two state supporters, in Israel at least, failed to address the question in this way. Grossman certainly didn't do that. And I didn't see the others who support two state solutions doing that either. In my experience, that hasn't changed still, not even now as the holes are unfolding. This is not a minor observation. And its reasons, I think, are not far to, to seek. For a long time now, formulating vision, a vision beyond the two-state solution was the only way to refrain from ignoring the Palestinians as subjects of fully equal rights, individual and national. In fact, the two-state doctrine, for those who mentioned it at all, and they are very few, <coughs> The two-state doctrine became a way to go on crushing Palestinians' rights while maintaining an illusion of peace. Perhaps I should just briefly mention the main reason for the irrelevance of the two-state doctrine here, for I think the reasons are very often misunderstood. Perhaps even we can say they're misunderstood for a colonialist way of thinking. The main obstacle to a two-state solution is not, as is commonly thought, it is not the number of settlers in the West Bank. It is, in fact, the number of Palestinians. In the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, and not a that now, I don't know if people here know, maybe uh, Stefan Detchen mentioned that last week or when he spoke, not a that can get me denaturalized in Germany. In the territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea now lives a Palestinian majority. Even the most generous two-state programs offer this majority about 22% of the territory, and that in two separated regions, Gaza and the West Bank. And that's before 
we mentioned the existence of about 700,000 settlers in the region. Many people in the liberal Zionist left went against Trump's deal of the century, but the truth is that under such conditions, two state alternatives have been for a long time not less hypocritical than Trump's um, deal of the century, among other things, because a function of such rotten compromises like Trump's deal was to, to strip Palestinians from their rights. You offer a rotten compromise to Palestinian, to the Palestinians, and if or once they refuse, they're then presented as unwilling to compromise, not to say anti-Semitic, and accordingly, ones with whom we cannot compromise for peace and for that reason have to continue fighting a war with. To employ the logic or the thinking of Avishai Margalit to make an argument that he would not make in this context. The, program, the problem with two-state compromises was never that they were unjust compromises. Good compromises almost always are unjust. The problem with the two-state lingo was, and it still is today, that it is not a compromise that can bring peace. Its assumptions are at this point ones that are willing to crush the Palestinians' rights rather than to recognize them as equal subjects to compromise with. Therefore, I fear that there is a straight line leading from this logic of logic of what and compromise that has been offered in the last 20 years to Palestinians and the way in which the current war in Gaza is being conducted. Perhaps the most precise way to say this is the following. At least ever since Kant, we know that a legitimate war is only fought with the prospect of peace. But this cannot be an abstract proposition only. The only way to fight this war with the prospect of peace, I would argue, is to understand something that has been repressed in some circles for a long time. And that is that you have to fight this war understanding that peace will not be in the form of a two-state solution. Fighting with the half-commitment to two-state illusions already emerges from a logic that is not really committed to peace, but is absolutely committed to the existence of Jewish sovereignty in the region. I think that the tacit implications of this logic are horrifying. This tacit logic was perhaps the clearest in the months that preceded October 7th, not just in the juridical overhaul, which obviously was not promoted by two state supporters, but in the response to the juridical overhaul. I think I mentioned that earlier. I think that um, remembering that um, Israel entered the current war while undergoing a constitutional crisis or a constitutional moment is an absolutely crucial but neglected feature of the current situation. <coughs> The juridical overhaul was clearly a settler's coup designed to destroy Israel's legal system from within. Note that I'm not saying Israel's rule of law, the legal system, in order to take the next steps in our post two state reality, intensify the control over the whole territory, exclude also Palestinian Israelis from Israeli elections, and so forth. It's really the next step in the unfolding of the one state reality. The Israeli opposition to this coup and the resistant movement, with their very impressive power in the Israeli center, refused to recognize any relation between the attack on the Supreme Court and the fact that it was promoted by parties that had announced, and those are quotes, a total war. That is Goebbels' term, a total war on the Palestinians and explicitly on their party's platforms called for the Palestinians' transfer. Within Israeli society, one state supporters were among the only ones who attempted to shout that the coup had, was in the first place about the Palestinians, not about Israelis, right, but about the Palestinians, that the attempt to avert the coup and resolve the constitutional crisis without addressing the fact 
that there is no democracy where while the country holds an apartheid regime would only reinforce the logic of the coup against the law rather than resolve it. Now, one of the most vivid examples of this logic was the constitutional program that Aaron Barak, Israel's former Supreme Court president and in some ways a real hero of Israel's liberal legal system, made just in the weeks, actually in the days before October 7th. I think there's a lot of symbolism in the fact that this is what it did just before October 7th. To solve the constitutional crisis, he proposed a twofold maneuver that draws on the authority of Israel's declaration of independence. First, he asked to interpret that document, which everybody agrees is not a constitution, as legally binding. So on this interpretation, it was illegal for the Knesset, for the parliament, to constitute laws, including basic laws, that contradict the Declaration of Independence, the idea of a Jewish and democratic state. Second, he proposed to start legislating basic law legislation, which would lay the norms according to the Declaration of Independence, specifically, again, true to the notion of a Jewish and democratic state for a constitution. Little problem with this proposal, which went completely unmentioned or unnoticed by Barack, the Declaration of Independence drew its legitimacy, among other things, from the United Nations Partition Resolution of 1947, which was, of course, based on a logic of separation. Since there was a Palestinian majority in the territory in 1947, the UN called to separate the land to two and establish a Jewish state and a Palestinian one. Similarly, today, there is a Palestinian majority in the territories under Israeli control, and no clear borders are drawn. But Barak's, Barak's program is no longer made in a context of separation. The country has no political or legal commitment to separation. Effectively, therefore, Barak was trying to make the Declaration of Independence, a commitment to a Jewish and democratic state, into a document with an unconditional authority. And the unconditionality here, I think, is significant and dangerous because it ignores any commitment to the legal, moral, and political conditions of such a doc document and ignoring the fact that they do not obtain. The irony is that this logic which in fact puts the existence of the Palestinian majority and the Palestinian people in the territory in question is continuous with, rather than contradictory to, the logic that created the constitutional crisis in the first place as extreme right parties officially calling for transfer and total war in those terms, also asked to undermine the court in order to achieve, in order to get rid of the Palestinians. The British historian Linda Colley once wrote, constitutions are often not just documents of liberty, but also weapons of oppression. Perhaps the clearest evidence of this continuity is the Supreme Court's own legacy and Barack's role as its president. A well-known adherent of the principle that everything is justiciable, Barack treated one matter is the exception to this rule. The legality of Israel's settlement project was treated as non-justiciable. The Supreme Court went down the very same path. The justices consistently, consistently determined that the law is not the right framework to decide on a question that is essentially political. That is, that the people, it's interesting to ask who are the people, not the law must decide whether they stand by the settlement project, which expresses the claim to the full territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, or accept the principle of partition. Little surprise that judges who justified themselves to the people to which the Palestinians do not belong, decided to make this topic, which concerns the Palestinians, not just rights, the Palestinians' very existence as non-justiciable. A little surprised that once the decision went to the people, the Jewish people, 
they decided the way that they have. The combination of making the settlement project as the one exception to an everything is justiciable court with the attempt to cement Israel's declaration of independence as absolutely valid without commitment to borders is unfortunately continuous to say the least, continuous or even the ground of the way in which the current war is being fought in Gaza. To people like myself, who said that the only way to defend the rule of law in a post two state reality is to deviate from the Declaration of Independence alleged authority, the commitment to a Jewish and democratic state, Barak said that the Declaration of Independence determines who we are. Deviating from it, and those are quotes actually, <coughs> deviating from it, quote, is not our way. This is not who we are. On October 6, this is just an anecdote and slightly self-serving. On October 6, I had a long piece out in Haaretz Weekend Edition, so that's just the day before, arguing that this logic, Barak's logic, will first seal the Palestinians' fate, and then it will also seal our, seal our fate. And still, that in a fundamental way, Barak was right, deviating from the Declaration of Independence is not our way. Rather, amid the constitutional crisis in a post two state reality, our way must urgently change. Now think again about Grossman's question, who will we be when we rise from the ashes or rather who will we be when we end up fighting this war? Will we be those who now take this alleged rule of law, alleged, allegedly really the opposite of the rule of law to its horrifying logical consequences. As I said, I think there is a straight line leading from the fact that the Supreme Court deemed the question of the settlements project non-justiciable, the fact that it did so despite international law, which determines the project illegal, the fact that someone like Aaron Barak proposed to anchor the Declaration of Independence while ignoring the moral and legal conditions of its very legitimacy, and the fact that those who argue in line of this logic are now treating international law in a very promiscuous way. We find this promiscuity in the writings of several and prominent authors, but perhaps the most important text to consider here briefly is one by David Enoch and Barak Medina, two professors at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and at Oxford, top experts in their fields. Medina, in fact, um, um, is a previous rector of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, the two are among the best authors that um, Israel now offers, um, people with good credentials, if I'm not mistaken, David Enoch was himself a conscientious objector who refused um, to serve in the occupied territories. This should be taken with a grain of salt. In any case, he would be remembered here, at least to some philosophers, as an author who quite fiercely criticized Oxford's earlier petition on the war, especially its call for an immediate ceasefire and the talk of genocide. In any case, Medina and Enoch named two assumptions in their texts, a text that they called what is allowed and what is not allowed in Israel's war on Hamas, one is that international law is important in this context, but cannot be the final authority. Something that I, um, in my view, was disturbing and needs to be spoken about, but um, I put it to the side for a moment to focus on another of their fundamental assumptions in the text, because I think it's very telling. And I quote from the text, our starting point is that Hamas poses an imminent and severe threat because it has repeatedly committed crimes against humanity on a very wide scale and has a vow to continue to do so. The threat is significant enough to justify attempting to kill anyone associated with the organization directly or indirectly to prevent the threat from materializing. I read it again because you don't have it in front of you. Our starting point is that Hamas poses an imminent and severe threat because it has repeatedly committed crimes against humanity on a very wild, wide scale 
and has avowed to continue to do so. The threat is significant enough to justify attempting to kill anyone associated with the organization, directly or indirectly, to prevent the threat from materializing. The basic premise of just war theory and laws of war is a categorical distinction between combatants and non-combatants. It is axiomatic of both that, putting for a moment difficult cases, only combatants constitute legitimate military targets. But this premise in Medina's and Enoch's text is that in Israel's current war against Hamas, that categorical distinction, in fact, has to be rejected. Not just combatants, but anyone associated with Hamas, directly or indirectly, is presumed a legitimate target of killing. This is a text that has been used and promoted by authorities as an important, um, important text um, influencing decisions. For example, in Germany, it certainly has had uh, uh, important lives, um, imp an important life, um, um, including by educational authorities, universities, and so forth. It should be mentioned that Hamas, a terrorist organization, has next to its military branch also a network of government officials, religious leaders, educational arms, and charity and social organizations. Among the people directly associated with the organizations are therefore clergy, teachers, charity workers, and cooks. They are all, according to Medina and Enoch, legitimate targets of killing. They are directly associated with Hamas. Now, I don't believe, by the way, that this was a slip of the tongue or just uncareful language, since Medina and Enoch are top experts in the field. They understand um, um, the stakes. And since they speak in the text, not of Hamas combatants, but of Hamas operatives, which can include this much, much broader category. And then they also underline that indirect associates are legitimate targets of killing. And what is meant here by indirect can only be anyone's guess. Do they include, for example, those who regularly pray at Hamas institutions? especially, say, if they regularly, regularly pay charity there? Do they include those who benefit from Hamas's charity organization and support them by, say, volunteering in them? It is impossible to tell, and this is the point, if by making all direct Hamas operatives legitimate targets of killing Enoch and Medina collapse the distinction between combatants and non-combatants, by speaking vaguely of those indirectly associated with Hamas as legitimate targets, they blur the distinction between operatives and civilians. The significant point here is the following, I think. Even in the first place, to prevent total war between people and to ensure that wars are preserved between armies with the prospect of peace. So there is an irony, if that's the right word, in the fact that those who complain about Oxford's warning from genocide are those who in the very same breath then blur the distinction between combatants and non-combatants in Gaza. I find this disturbing, especially in our post to two-state context and against the backdrop of constitutional proposals like Barak's and the point is this, Hamas, despite its genocidal terrorism and immense success implementing it on October 7th, does not pose an existential threat to Israel. But there is an existential threat to the Jewish and democratic state, the one that was in fact exposed when I spoke about Aaron's Barak's constitutional proposal. In a post two-state era, the Jewish and democratic state is threatened by the very existence of the Palestinian people as a majority under Israeli control. Under such circumstances, as Israel's president himself, Herzog, was speaking of Gaza's population as responsible for Hamas, as genocidal ministers are sitting in cabinet, and as bipartisan transfer plans are being proposed by the center left together with the right, 
The main task of philosophers, hopefully, is to reinforce the categorical distinction between combatants and non-combatants, not to dismiss it while complaining that people are shouting genocide too much. This was, by the way, among reasons why I was so worried by uh, Habermas' statement here in Germany. The fear is a straight line again between Barak's making Israel's declaration of independence a conditionless legal argument without borders and Medina in a north blurring of the difference between Palestinian combatants and non-combatants. Now, to be sure, it is true that Hamas itself has made it especially difficult to preserve that distinction between combatants and non-combatants. Hamas combatants do not wear a uniform, and mostly they do so in order to disguise themselves as civilians. They really do make a point to use mosques, hospitals, and schools as protection. I think there should be really no excuses for this type of behavior. There is a reason why a whole system of tunnels was built in Gaza for Hamas combatants, but no bunkers for civilians were built while weapons are kept and fired from areas that should be absolutely protected. Pro-Palestinians who care about Palestinian lives should really say this about Hamas's methods clearly, not just dismiss this as Israeli propaganda. However, while the fact that Hamas should be held responsible for embedding itself very deliberately within the civilian population, this fact alone does not take away Israel's responsibility to protect Gaza's population. The standards of this protection are commonly determined by the ambiguous, very ambiguous term of proportionality, which I'm no um, expert of this, but know enough in order to know that very few people think it is accurate enough to protect people. One way to understand that Israel's responsibility to protect the civilian population in Gaza, even if fighting against Hamas, is to imagine what could have been a merely imaginary scenario not too long ago, but with this war became much less imaginary. Hamas has taken over an Israeli village or kidnapped hundreds of civilians, using them as human shields. The fact that Hamas is using or would have been using those people as human shield puts responsibility on Hamas. But such a, um, an example proves immediately that this does not take away Israel's responsibility to protect these civilians. I think the only way to legitimately fight this war is by the far-fetched standard, and you can ask me in a moment why it matters if it is so far-fetched. The far-fetched standard, according to which when you attack a military target, a Hamas military target in Gaza, you have to assume that the so-called collateral damage is the Israeli civilians. In a 2009 essay in the New York Review of Books, this very standard was proposed by two philosophers. And that's a quote now. This is a guideline that we advocate. Conduct your war in the presence of non-combatants on the other side with the same care as if your citizens were the non-combatants. Again, this is a guideline that we advocate. Conduct your war in the presence of non-combatants on the other side with the same care as, the, as if your citizens were the non-combatants. This sentence was written in a piece on Israel's war with Hamas and Hezbollah by Michael Walzer and Avishai Margalit, hardly suspicious of being anti-Israeli or anti-Zionists. This is a principle that one state supporters need to hold today, I think. And I point out that Walzer, at least, has written nowadays on the war, but refrained, as far as I can see, from going back to re-articulating this principle. I think that this principle needs to be the one um, that's being promoted. First, Palestinian civilians are not citizens of a sovereign enemy state. They are stateless, a fact that has everything to do with the long history of Israeli occupation and still de facto control 
of the territory of Gaza and of its people. That makes this principle even more valid, even more plausible than what it would have been as a merely abstract principle. Second, it follows from the commitment to fight a war with a view to making possible future peace. In this territory, there will not be a two-state solution. Stated negatively, that's the reason why we must prevent that this war will become between peoples rather than combatants. Stated positively, this means that fighting the war with an eye to the possibility of peace demands treating Palestinian non-combatants as if they are our citizens. Peace in the region can only be imagined under the condition that one day they will share citizenship with us. This is, of course, again, only an ideal, but it is the only ideal, I think, that posits an alternative to the holes that we're witnessing in the present and to the other ideals of separation that, in fact, have promoted the holes and have led to them rather than show the direction beyond them. Coming then back to Grossman, who will we be? In a certain sense, I think we will not be the ones who give the answer. We will be the ones constituted by the fact that we're giving it. The answer will have to be in some sense prior to us. It has to gather the few Israelis and Palestinians who will be still willing to stand together, even today. Some of those groups exist maybe especially today, and say we, the inhabitants of this territory, was it an alternative to a logic of separation that has become a logic of annihilation. And I'm done. Thanks very much, Amri, for those very uh, interesting remarks. I invite people uh, to post uh, questions. Let, let me start. Um, with one of my own, I just wondered if you could say more about almost the, the 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 very last line in your talk that peace is achievable uh, only in a situation of something you said like of of equal citizenship for all people within one territory. How I mean, normally, often when that's said, the usual answer is well, because Palestinians will outnumber Jews, as you said, that that is the end of the idea of a of a Jewish a Jewish democratic state. What's your answer to that? It used to be, uh, we just need a, um, an electoral college and that would solve it. The, uh, um, um, I think that, you know, there, there are many different worries on both sides for the, the different ways in which um, uh, power on each side can override um, um, the other side. Um, Jews are um, worried because of the numbers. Um, uh, Palestinians are worried because of the, the power, the money, the, um, the infrastructure, and so forth. There's, um, 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 there are real worries. I think that we will have to find ways to negotiate into a constitution the way that the, the principle that would prevent that each side has a right to um, override the national rights of the other. So if you have a, a binational framework in general, and um, each of the autonomies working within such a binational framework um, is preserving um, the right of self-determination of each of the people, the constitution that would unify this structure would have to be written such that no matter um, the numbers, no matter the power, no side has the power to undermine the national rights and the right to self-determination of the other side. And, um, you know, I never took myself, some people have accused me that my uh, suggestions for a federation were too abstract. I actually never, I never took that um, um, for a real accusation that bothered me. And the reason is that I think that the details are something that needs to be worked out when actual people sit together and um, negotiate those terms. I, I think that um, had I came and suggested those uh, terms, the, the accusations would be, in fact, more justified. 
I think what we need to do is to show that a constellation of the sort is possible, that it can be imagined as an alternative. The way in which those solutions would be then worked out um, will have to be worked out by the people. I think that the worries are genuine. Uh, they're not just about the rights of people. After October 7th, uh, uh, Jews are worried, not just um, not just for the rights or rights of national self-determination. They're, they're afraid, they want to know who will protect them. Um, rightly so. I think that we still need to take the first steps beyond um, those fears slowly. This will not happen um, anytime soon, I think. So let me just ask one more question, then we'll we'll turn to the questions that are being asked now. Just so I understand the argument on about the, the Declaration of Independence, is, is it your view that in your binational state, that, that a binational state of, of uh, separate but separate but equal, if I can use that phrase, uh, sovereignties, if you will, is consistent with the Declaration of Independence because you will still be maintaining an independent democratic Jewish state in one form, or is it not in, not consistent? It's a good question, and um, maybe maybe I shouldn't answer it uh, too clearly. I think that, uh, let's put it this way, I think that the way the Declaration of Independence is, is commonly understood, it is inconsistent with it. I think that the Declaration of Independence can be, especially by Jews, uh, interpreted in uh, very creative ways in order to, um, to show that it could be actually also consistent with a federative uh, framework. Um, so I think we don't necessarily need to give um, a, a straight explicit answer saying, oh, the Declaration of Independence um, needs to be just abandoned. The way I wrote it on October 6th, actually. So, um, you know, I actually, in a way, answered. I was never asked that before, but I actually, you know, I tried to answer as we go. Uh, on October 6th, I actually said, we don't necessarily have to give up on the Declaration of Independence. What has to be given up is a Declaration of Independence as a source of sole authority. It cannot be relied on as the only authority in the region. It needs to be opened up for, um, competing to to have competing documents that would somehow be uh, consistent with it rather than um, undermine it. And the only way to preserve the commitments of the Declaration of Independence is to give up on the commitment to it being the only authority in the region. One fact that is sometimes forgotten, this is now really details, but actually, you know, I actually wrote those interpretations already. A lot of people in Israel like to rely also on Aaron Barak. They like to rely on a famous line from the Declaration of Independence that Israel will be um, fully equal to all uh, people, regardless of uh, race, um, uh, sex, and uh, uh, religion, and so forth. This is a nice line. But people often forget the line that comes before it, which says that Israel will be founded on the principles, and I don't remember the exact quote, on the principle of justice, freedom, and peace. And one thing that's actually important here is that I think you can show that this is a quote from the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which actually draws on the general principle of um, um, human dignity. Israel's Declaration of Independence begins by a big part that speaks about the rights of the historical and national rights of Jews to Eretz Israel. And then it has a second part that says, we will have to adopt a constitution. And then when they say we'll have to adopt a constitution, they say the constitution will actually draw on the principles of justice, freedom, and peace. That is, you could say that the constitution will draw not on the right of the Jews to um, Eretz Israel, but on the commitment to uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In fact, those are things that I've been trying to write. This is, you know, um, speaking about this today as the bombs are falling in Gaza and the holes are unfolding is a bit too far-fetched, but um, um, maybe even very far-fetched. But the um, 
you could have had those maneuvers. Okay, I'll move to the questions. By the way, uh, one of the participants says, uh, raised a hand. Um, we can't recognize people that way. If you have a question, please put it uh, in the Q and A. So the first question comes uh, from Jenny Spector, a student here at the New School. What possibility is there to reharness the power of the protest movement from the constitutional crisis in a way that would promote confidence for a new paradigm of peace building? And then also, can you speak to joint Israeli-Palestinian groups like a land for all and standing together that support alternatives to the two-state solution? What power do they have in the country? What coalition building is possible? Yeah, the first part of the question, I think, is too optimistic. And this is actually important. The second, I think, is where the, the small actual hope, very small, but more actual uh, would emerge from me. I um, do not think that the Israeli protest movement, um, unfortunately, was um, at this point part of uh, the hope. When it started, I was trying to speak, you know, I was skeptical, but still I thought there was room and it was very important to have uh, a Jamesian will to believe and say, look, this mobilization, mobilization is important and we have to endorse it and see what will emerge out of it. I think that at some point into the demonstrations, it became too obvious that um, uh, the protesters are, the dynamics that unfold is not a dynamic that recognizes that um, what's being attacked is actually the rights of Palestinians and that there will be no um, um, alternative in Israel and no alternative to the occupation. Um, if we say that, but quite the opposite. I thought that the protest movement was uh, generating deep, not even patriotism, but nationalism. Hundreds of thousands of people marching every weekend on the streets, wrapped in Israel flags, like they were talit, speaking about the Jewish and democratic state without saying a word Really, really. I mean, I'm, usually when I say this, and people like to say no, but some words were said. That's true. Some things were said, but basically, no significant power without within the um, um, that um, protest movement um, to the actual logic of the occupation. And for that reason, I feared, and I still fear, that that protest generated a lot of the national and nationalistic sentiments that were pushed by the government, they just reintroduced them through consensus. And especially after the war, I fear that um, a lot of those um, emotions um, will be articulated in a, you know, they will not sound like Ben Gvir and Smotrich. They will sound much nicer, but they would be very harmful and dangerous and they will be impossible to fight. And um, I think that that is something that I feared during the, the, the months of the protest. And I think that now after the war, we have to say, it. I, I'm not sure that um, this is where the alternative will come from. <laughs> Organizations like uh, Undim Beachad standing together um, um, is a good example um, of an organization of people, um, of younger Palestinian, Israeli Palestinians and uh, Jews trying to do politics together, partly also municipal politics, which I think is interesting and um, it's a way to go bottom up in an interesting way. Um, they um, did try to pose an alternative to this logic and they're now under a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure from the government, a lot of pressure from neighbors, a lot of uh, I don't know that their do whether their donors are still giving money. I hope so. It's possible that those who gave the money before are committed enough to do this um, still. I'm not so sure. Um, they are positing the alternative, and they managed to mobilize a few demonstrations and a few meetings that were the government tried to crash them, right? Um, I don't know if those stories are familiar in the United States, but um, there was a moment when the police actually shut down. Um, um, uh, such a meeting in Haifa. Um, they will be the alternative. I think that they need a framework. There are several different frameworks uh, in the air. Mine is one of them. Um, in the air, ideas of a federation are floating. And um, 
those will be the people who will have to adopt such programs and maybe eventually be the, the bridge um, to having this language also with Palestinians. Again, um, it was very far-fetched to speak about this before October 7th, um, to speak about this now when we don't even know what this will look like in the day after. I think that the things are not over and they're bound to get much worse. Um, um, but those would have been some of the bridges. Um, how to think about them today, I'm not so sure. This is what we need. Um, yeah. Sort of following on that question of the Federation, there's a question from Howard Steele. Um, what do you think of the idea that is being floated to model the next stage of Israeli democracy as a federation on the model of the EU? So there would be two states and Israeli settlers now living in the West Bank would continue to live there as part of the Palestinian state, while some Palestinian Israelis may identify primarily linked to the Palestinian state. I think we should be open to all um, proposals that um, will make possible imagining decent existence for both people. And that generally could be one of them. Um, if that's the model, that would be the model because, for example, this would allow um, the region, the, the um, inhabitants of the whole region um, to settle wherever they want. Palestinians also will be able to um, um, live in Israel. Israelis will be able to live, um, say, in the West Bank. This is problematic for many reasons. For example, this is where Palestinians get very nervous for, for good reasons um, because they say, okay, the Jews will be able to just, you know, um, um, occupy us by buying the land and by building and um, that that's an illegitimate worry. Proposals of this sort, again, very ideal, they're not going to happen anytime soon, um, are the type of proposals that we need. Here is one worry that I have um, about the confederative as opposed to the federative framework. Um, if we say that the difference between a federation and a confederation is that a confederation is between two or more sovereign states and that a federation is between sub-sovereign um, uh, entities. My worry is that um, if the idea of confederation that is that is being floated, and in fact has been floated even by people like Yossi Balin, and you know, uh, Yossi Balin was the architect of Oslo, he started speaking about confederation, which is surprising if you know him. I mean, again, he's a good man, but he's a, a good Zionist in, in ways that he would not go usually to those places. My worry about some of the ideas of confederation is that they're being proposed because people still want to preserve the old Jewish and democratic commitment. And um, so they want to have their cake and eat it too, right? You want to say, okay, we, there will not be a two-state solution, so let's do uh, something uh, other than that, but keep our Jewish state. I understand the sentiment, but I think that the task is to understand how this transformation needs to be a transformation beyond the idea of a Jewish state and Jewish sovereignty, which in fact has produced um, um, a lot of what we're seeing. Uh, uh, Israelis are not the only criminals, Palestinians are not saints, but um, the logic of Jewish sovereignty is inseparable from the logic of occupation. And um, for that reason, if we could have a confederation, interesting, but I doubt that the, um, the dynamics um, of the people who ask for a confederation will be the dynamics that produce a change in thinking that we need in order to um, um, take steps further. So that would be my, my question about those frameworks. A question from Thomas Cantone. Uh, the talk mentions hope in its title. The content of the talk, however, does not seem hopeful that there are elements within the Israeli government, even on the left, capable of mounting real opposition, opposition against a pro-settler ultranationalistic right. Perhaps Omri could elaborate on what is what hope is there is. I'm sorry. Perhaps Omri could elaborate on what hope there is left, uh, or what this hope amounts to, given this more pessimistic picture of the state of things he's offered. 
Thanks, Thomas. <coughs> um, a Kantian's question. The uh, um, art implies can, and uh, whatever ought to be is possible. That's very, um, that's a weak argument here. Um, the title offered hope, the talk offered um, little hope. The only thing that I can do, if you ask me descriptively what I think is going to happen, um, frankly, I don't want to even tell you what I think is going to happen. I think that the situation um, as a, um, an attempt to, to make a prediction about the future, um, I think as a descriptive uh, claim, I think the future is horrifying and offers little hope. This doesn't change the fact that the only thing that we can do in order to act is to try to formulate the ideals um, by which we should act and uh, should try to convince others as much as we can um, that we ought to act. And um, the hope that I'm formulating is um, simply presented um, through the um, an attempt to sketch an ideal of what needs to happen. What are the ideal principles that we'll have to abide to in order to uh, make progress rather than just cement the logic that has brought us to where we are? We have to act as if we can actually follow those principles and that uh, as if we can try to convince others to do that. Um, if you ask me if I think that we'll be able to do that, I was more hopeful, let me say this, I was more hopeful during the juridical, before October 7th, a lot of people lost hope. And I actually thought, if you're now losing your hope, you probably never had it. I, th I saw an opportunity in the juridical, juridical overhaul because there was at least a shakeup that seemed to enable um, a certain system to, um, to form new alliances to show at least to some people that new alliances would form. It was a moment also of great pessimism. And those were moments where I actually had some hope. It is very difficult to, to have it now. I, I agree about that. But um, the Hoffnung stirbt zuletzt, sagt man auf Deutsch. Yeah, here's a question from Kevin Howry. Is a one-state solution with equal citizenship within one authority something popularly desired by a majority of Palestinians? I find it compelling, but I wonder why it is not more often expressed in conversations within the U.S., which appears to be a model of such a solution. The yet historic, uh, well, I'll stop there in the question. There was a moment um, three years ago when most people who were asked in the West Bank, in fact, favored uh, this solution. I didn't take those uh, polls to, um, you know, um, I, I wouldn't rely on them and just be very uh, naively optimistic, but it was an interesting result. And it was also an interesting result because one thing that was maybe a little bit reliable about it was that you could actually witness a change. The same polls a couple of years before actually showed a different result. And you could see that um, there was um, a good percentage of Palestinians who were asking for that. Um, I think that Palestinians within Israel would be interested in that, even though, interestingly enough, most Palestinian Israeli parties do not speak that language explicitly. I've spoken to some of the uh, leaders asking them about this. Um, my impression is that they're in a difficult spot, Israeli Palestinians, regarding such proposals. Maybe it has to be promoted by Jews. And the reason is, um, first, Palestinians, Palestinian Israelis, even if they think favorably about such proposals, do not want to be and really cannot be the ones who would uh, somehow negotiate away the idea of Palestinian sovereignty. They do not want to be the ones who will give up on the two-state solution if the two-state solution is a way for Palestinians to achieve a Palestinian state. I understand that pressure. They cannot do that as Israeli citizens who are Palestinians. That's one reason. 
The other reason is, um, should be mentioned, Israeli law, in fact, does not allow you to run to parliament if you do not believe in the idea of a Jewish and democratic state. This means that um, someone like me, say, if I wanted to run to parliament, it's not obvious that I would be allowed to run. By Israeli law, every person who, this is more or less a quote from uh, uh, Clause 7a of uh, a basic law, the Knesset, every person who in word or deed contradicts um, uh, Israel's existence as a Jewish and democratic state um, is not allowed to run to parliament. That's this extension of the principle of uh, militant democracy from preserving democracy to uh, preserving the Jewish democracy, which, as I argued, is not an extension of this principle. It's not a revision of this principle, but in fact, it's putting this principle on its head because the idea of militant democracy was that you cannot rob citizens of their sovereignty. The will of the people cannot by the will of the people rob citizens of their sovereignty. And here, exactly the opposite is the case. The law says the citizens will not rob the people of their sovereignty. Palestinians who would be making proposals like those would arguably not be allowed to run. And for that reason, Palestinian Israelis have difficulties um, if they want to do politics. Um, to make such proposals. Uh, but I think that we, ne we need to put those pressures, again, constantly with that footnote. This is a language that is not stated here naively while the bombs are falling in Gaza. But this is, uh, I mean, if, if we are to think also in political terms, then we need to understand that those will be the pressures. I think that we will have to try to find ways to mobilize such solidarities like uh, standing together that was mentioned by Jennifer, I think, um, um, into political parties that would offer such constellations, maybe for the whole region. But um, part of the pressure is that, um, you know, this, the Israeli Supreme Court is not necessarily allowing such parties to run. Esther Hayut, the outgoing president of the Supreme Court, in fact, threatened Balan, an Israeli-Palestinian party that does promote such politics at least sometimes, threatened them. They were excluded by the uh, Knesset's um, um, com elections committee. The Supreme Court then enabled them to run. But Esther Hayut said very clearly, um, if you will again propose bills for Israel, the state of all its citizens, it is not clear that you will be able to run. And um, those pressures will have to be fought against. They are related again to the way in which the war in Gaza is being fought. Okay. There's a question. The person's identified by one name, uh, Dol Dolune, if I'm saying that right. Um, thanks for a stimulating talk. What do you think would be the role of secularism in building such a federative framework? Could this one state solution be possible with a religiously informed constitutional framework? I don't think that the constitution should be religiously informed, um, but um, perhaps secularism, I'm not, I'm not sure that I know exactly how it's meant the term secularism here, but let's, let's put it this way. On both sides, Jews and Palestinians, I think that a lot of people are afraid from the power of religion. There is a huge power of religion, real, fanaticism. Hamas is one example. Um, ben Gvir, Smotrich, and others are another example. And my impression is that the only hope that uh, secular people have in the region, Jews and Palestinians, is if they will understand that their alliances are not, my alliances as a, as a Jew are not with Jewish religious fanatics who actually will be happy to sacrifice me. And they would, by the way. Um, same for Palestinians with Hamas. Um, but at least one of the dimensions in this um, conflict, if some of those alliances 
um, of Jews and Palestinians would form also because people would like to have secular, I'm not going to call it liberal and get into trouble at the new school, but uh, secular, liberal, um, democratic alliances of Jews and Palestinians who understand their interests and their commonalities as, in fact, much much closer to each other than um, uh, the alliances that they have with their um, you know, fellow Jews and fellow Palestinians who happen to be religious fanatics, then we would take a step forward. And in fact, we would be the majority in the territory, not the religious fanatics. Um, again, I, I think that under some constellations, in some contexts, which is not the context of what's happening now, one could have at least imagined that some such parties would form, say, because of the constitutional crisis. Um, whether we'll be able to imagine this in the foreseeable future is hard to tell. Okay, this is a question from Chinsir. Thank you for a wonderful talk, Omri. Can you speak to what you think will happen in the coming weeks if this is not an unfair question? Do you think that Netanyahu has a clear plan for expelling Palestinians from Gaza through the Egyptian border and is implementing it? And also, can you say something about U.S. responsibilities in this disaster? Yes. Hi, Chinsia. I hope I, I could see. Um, I can I can say what I think, and uh, I'm not very optimistic. But um, you know, this is uh, it draws. Since now we're looking about you know about uh, very serious accusations, uh, maybe that I'm going to make. I have to say, I don't have evidence for them. Uh, I have my analysis of what I'm seeing and the way I interpret the original situation that brought us where we are and um, what's unfolding. I have, I'm horrified by what's happening. That's, I suppose, uh, we have your 52 people, I suppose that's all of them. But I fear that the answer to your question is not good, is um, that the initial conditions going into this war for the reasons that I tried to lay down were um, prone to the notion of ethnic cleansing. Uh, they put a lot, a lot of pressure in the direction of uh, ethnic cleansing. Um, the, the reason is, regardless of Netanyahu, you ask Netanyahu, before we speak even about Netanyahu, there is a Palestinian majority in the, in the territory. Short of a two-state solution, something needs to be done. The idea that you can contain the Palestinians went away on October 7th. The Palestinians will not be contained. I don't think that two-state fantasies, even as fantasies, are going to be revived anytime soon. And the reason is that Israelis and Israeli politicians would not accept it. What happened in um, uh, uh, next to Gaza on October 7th, people immediately imagine, that, that I can say, they immediately say, you know, if you establish now a Palestinian state in the West Bank, what we saw happening coming from Gaza will come from the West Bank to the basically the whole border of Israel. By the way, people forget the border with Lebanon, Hezbollah has huge firepower there. People are really afraid of um, what could have happened if Hezbollah had the same success that Hamas had on October 7th. And the view, the idea that a Palestinian state would be established as um, an existential threat. And for that reason, I don't think that two-state politics, or even again, pretending about it, will be in the making. For that reason, I fear very much that Israeli politicians, not just Netanyahu, I fear that also Yair Lapid and Benny Gantz, if they look at this juncture now in history, seeing the Palestinian majority, seeing that there will not be a two-state solution, thinking that something has to be done and that the historical moment to do it is now. It will not return, not so fast. And I fear very much that for that reason, even just abstractly now, people are considering the worst. That's one thing. Second thing, all the population from the northern part of Gaza were transferred to the south. <laughs> allegedly, or not only allegedly, 
nobody knows to protect them. But of course, as you know, I know that Chinsia knows. They're now fighting in the south. So what was one of the most populated regions in the world is now in the south of Gaza, doubly as populated, if not more. And we're now fighting exactly there. While Netanyahu is refusing to reveal his end game. <clears throat> I fear that um, at some point, Israeli strategists cannot pretend anymore that this is not itself part of a strategy. That you put the whole of the whole population of Gaza in the south, you're now putting a lot of pressure in the south, and that you're actually creating such a pressure that what we think is almost impossible, that is that Palestinians will just at some point go beyond the border, it will become a necessity. And um, I fear very much that this is part of a strategy. I cannot say that this is a part of a strategy. I have no knowledge of the stra strategy. But, but, I, but, but I don't know that, um, I'm not sure what the strategy can be if, if that's what's being done. I was alarmed when I saw, some people here would know, uh, Ram Ben Barak and uh, Danny Danone publishing this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal suggesting a voluntary transfer out of Gaza. Ram Ben Barak is uh, number two, if I'm not mistaken, in Yair Lapid's center-left party, the former um, 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 deputy uh, head of the Mossad, former chairman of the Knesset Security Committee, Danny Danone, former ambassador to the UN. Those two people writing a bipartisan proposal for transfer, I think, again, I don't know this for a fact, I would be surprised if the analysts in Washington do not look at that and know perfectly well that such an op-ed cannot be written without people taking account the significance that this has to the war, because this can actually influence Israel's international relations as a war is happening. People like that do not just write an op-ed. Um, this needs to be coordinated. Um, such a balloon um, horrifies me. So I'm... I hope that uh, the United States will put all its way to prevent it. I don't know that they would. There was a moment, I maybe I answered Chinsia too long already. There was, um, I was happy and I still sort of am happy when Biden is now, this will sound paradoxical after my talk, is saying two state solution. And he's actually saying that a lot. I think that <coughs> For, for two decades at least, saying two-state solution was a way to ignore the Palestinians. It was a lie that was meant to ignore the Palestinians. There is something, again, also answering Thomas, tr trying to find some hope. When Biden and Blinken shout two-state solution, they're lying. But maybe it's a lie that's actually make, is supposed to make us now not ignore the Palestinians. Um, it meant to still say, we're still committed to the idea that this will be resolved, um, recognizing the Palestinians have to stay. And um, maybe um, the responsibility of the United States is to prevent crimes against humanity um, perpetrated by its ally and to protect the civilian population uh, in Gaza and the West Bank. And um, Yeah, I, I don't know that they will that they will do that. I, I think it is probably in their interest to do that, but I, but I'm not sure how they're thinking about that. Remember, here's another question uh, about the U.S. from Zaret. It says, "Wouldn't the U.S. oppose a binational state? After all, such a state would be quote unquote neutral. The U.S. relies on Israel as a heavily armed ally, e.g., against Iran." Have the few people who support a binational state considered the problem of the United States? It's an interesting question. I'm hard for me, hard for me to be so uh, so certain. I think that at this point, the the war in the Middle East and the situation in Israel is a huge. Uh, destabilizer in ways that I'm not so sure uh, is playing for your American interests. <laughs> and um, dismantling um, some of the conflicts in the region um, could probably uh, play into 
American interests as well, with uh, say treaties with uh, Saudi. Look, um, one, one, one theory about October 7th, which I think is at least, you know, explains part of uh, what we saw, that one reason why October 7th happened was the deal with the Saudis also. The Saudis was a, um, the Saudis were, was a strategic blow, blow to Iran. Really a huge deal. If Israel and the Saudis um, had a deal, um, Iran would find itself um, in a real problem in the region. And um, one could think that almost a sufficient reason for doing something that would prevent such a, such a deal um, was um, the corner in which Iran would find itself um, due to such a, um, a constellation. Would it be um, necessarily against American interests that um, a binational state with good ties to the um, Arab world in the region wouldn't see? I'm not assuming that uh, the US will stand on its back feet to prevent that. Okay, here's a question um, from uh, Corey uh, Kaliskan. Um, Many progressive Israeli friends and comrades felt alone and estranged as a result of their traditional allies' reactions to Hamas terror. Can you speak about this a bit and contextualize it? Yes, I felt the same. I um, was critical and angry about some of the responses that I saw. This is still unfolding. Um, you know, my father cannot be suspected of being, a, um, a, I don't know, a normalizer of Israeli occupation uh, sent me today. He's a social worker and professor of social work. He sent me, his friends from Columbia University in the social work department are sending, you know, uh, basically um, teachings about uh, Hamas's achievements on October 7th. And, you know, he's horrified. This is not someone who would politicize. Uh, he votes for the joint list um uh, among the other 500 jews who do that and the um you, you see that and it's it's very difficult to know what to tell to your colleagues i thought that um judith butler's uh, essay in the london review books was important in this context i thought this showed um a good way to think about that. The way I understood that essay that came early on was to say, look, was in many ways a response to what happened at Harvard, I think. Um, Hamas crime need to be condemned as Hamas crime. You cannot relate to this crime as um, just a modality of Israeli violence against itself by means of doing violence to the Palestinians. Palestinians have agency and the um, Hamas's agency and and the awful um, uh, heinous crimes really cannot be attributed to Israeli violence and they need to be condemned. Same for the bombing that was back then almost just starting um, of Israel in Gaza. We, we all know the argument. Um, it's awful that Palestinian kids are dying in Gaza, but this is Hamas's responsibility. We cannot say that, and of course we cannot say that. It is Israel's responsibility. We have to ascribe Israel responsibility and hold it accountable. Um, we need to hold both sides accountable here, but we should not stay with these um, condemnations. What we need to do, and this is where I'm very near to uh, Judith, um, the main task is to um, imagine a way of cohabitation beyond that, and that's very much where I also come from. This is my main anger also. It's not, actually, maybe not. It's one of my main angers also um, with what I saw at, with the left um, um, and um, in academic context in the US and elsewhere. It is among other things that it failed exactly that. It failed to ascribe responsibility, clear responsibility to the crimes of Hamas, and I thought that was important. But there's something even deeper here. It failed for that reason, that ideal that I was trying to argue for, of cohabitation. Because <clears throat> the fact that I would not 
uh, build a binational state with uh, um, the terrorists who did what they did on October 7th goes without saying. But I also will not be able to go on building that state together, at least conceiving it together, promoting it together, walking in solidarity together with those who were unable to condemn Hamas crime for what it was. The inability of um, um, people on some form of uh, pro-Palestinian uh, left, the inability to take a clear stance against Hamas was a huge blow to the trust that is necessary to take the moves that I'm hoping to promote. And that was one of the reasons of the anger and the feeling of betrayal. I will say that when the Israeli left started to mobilize against that, with friends like Eva Iluz and others who wrote against that trend, I did not join them either because I thought they failed the same test here. They also failed to, uh, when condemning the left now, the global left as I speak about it now in Israel, they did not say a word about now protecting international law, lives in Gaza, um, speaking against um, um, transfer plans and so forth. They just complained about um, the left. I thought that both sides here failed. The Israeli left, in my view, has failed now for a long time. It failed to imagine positions that would enable us to look at Palestinians as equal subjects of rights. And now we have to say, and life. Um, both sides here failed me, or failed me. They, I was personally um, um, disappointed. Um, there were, of course, the exceptions. Some exceptions in Israel, uh, my friend Michael Sfad is wonderful, and he's an exception to that. Adala, um, a human rights, a Palestinian Israeli human rights organization in Israel, I thought took a, a, an excellent stance. By the way, they also took an excellent stance during the juridical overhaul. Um, it took them less than 24 hours to have a very clear statement. They are, you know, in Israel, they would count as the traitors, right? They speak clearly about apartheid, they speak clearly against the Jewish and democratic state. They do all that from the position of law. They want to uphold a democratic constitution and the rule of law, and they speak clearly about its conditions as from the perspective of, let's say, general law and from the perspective um, of them being Palestinians. I think those are the people we, we need to work with. Adala didn't need more than 24 hours to have a wonderful, clear statement speaking about Hamas's crimes, something that I would have loved to see coming um, from some academic circles that did not manage to produce that together immediately, immediately with focusing all that we can in demanding clearly uh, the protection of um, the lives of Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank also um, at this point. Um, those were my feelings and those were the alternatives that I found um, where I found hope. Well, I guess we can end this with the word hope, Amri. That's a nice, nice way to do it. Um, we're we're out of time. We've got a couple more questions we don't have time for. I apologize to the askers. Um, Amri, these were really um, incredibly interesting, um, deep thoughts here. Um, I appreciate it. I know this is a difficult time for you in thinking through these issues, both intellectually and in other ways. Um, must be a, a, a difficult time for you. Let me just put it that way. And I appreciate you spending the time with us. Uh, hope you come back and see us sometime here at the New School. Look forward to seeing you hopefully uh, early in the new year. Uh, but uh, take care and thank you again uh, for participating and, and for this general seminar. And goodbye to all the listeners. Thanks very much.